I wanted to start off um, by talking about the future of healthcare. This is something I've been working on quite a lot recently. And what I thought would be quite a good idea is to set the scene about what, where the problems are with today's healthcare system and what are the likely transformations that are going to come. And a lot of that is based around technology and based around new forms of relationships with patients, which UB is right in the middle of. So what I'm going to do is just paint a bigger picture for you of the healthcare landscape, where technology is going and how healthcare is likely to transform. And through that, set the bigger picture, set the bigger context through which uh, we can then look at UB as, as, a, as a really exciting innovation. So uh, I'm going to take you on a long journey. So I hope you've got your uh, uh, energy levels with you because we're going to go from massive world changing societal problems right through to genes and proteins and artificial intelligence. We're going to cover the whole journey. So uh, hopefully you're with me on this. Right, we'll start first of all by having a look at healthcare itself. So what this graph is really, a very simple one, is showing that uh, in terms of treating sickness, the costs to the state, and this is the, this is the UK, but the same model applies to pretty much any healthcare system, is that as people go from healthy through to risky, through to the early stage of things like diabetes and chronic disease, there's a progression that people go through to ever more greater levels of chronic disease and then, of course, end-of-life care. And as people go from healthy to less healthy to sick, there is a great cost there to be borne, uh, both by individuals, because they, they're suffering from these diseases, but also by the state that then has to step in and provide healthcare support. And what we're seeing across the UK and pretty much across every healthcare system is that chronic disease is becoming the big problem. Uh, a long time ago, it was mainly infectious disease or maybe injuries that would be the majority of what the healthcare system would look to be able to treat you and patch you up. But now in the UK, 70% of the entire healthcare costs are in supporting people with chronic disease. So this is a big problem. And it's a big problem from a clinical perspective, but chronic disease also has its origins in unhealthy behaviours. So as we know, as we're getting fatter, as we exercise less, as we get more stressed, uh, as there's still quite a lot of alcohol and unofficial drugs taken. These things all contribute towards the onset of chronic disease. So as we think about a future which is not just about treating the disease when it happens, but going a little bit upstream and think, how can we prevent the conditions that then lead to the disease? Any future model that looks at a sustainable healthcare system has both got to treat disease better with the new medication and treatment, but also try and help people to prevent them from getting sick in the first place. Now, this is particularly pertinent for when we think about young people, because children are our future, they are the next generation. And although lots of progress has been made in uh, leading to healthier outcomes, if you look a century ago and look at the average life expectancy and now roll the clock forward to now, we're living much longer, much healthier. But there are still uh, problems that uh, exist in the younger generation. And let's just have a quick look at that. So I'm going to show you a couple of quick pictures here. One, they're just simply measures to reflect some of the challenges. So don't bother about too much the detail of this. But when you look at hospital admissions for young people, so this is age and years from 10 to 24, what we're seeing is that, of course, they, they grow in, in terms of volumes as people enter into teenage years. People tend to be a little bit more risky in teenage years. Um, but also, there's, what's really interesting is that the socio-economic element of it, and this is reflected in wider society, is that the poorer the area, the more likely you are to be sick. So underneath this challenge of prevention is not just treating everyone equally, but recognizing that people in lower economic groups have a greater propensity for disease. So there's an extra challenge to get in there and, and think about that. But if you look at causes of death for young people, 
There's a whole bunch of diseases there, and there's other types of problems uh, that cause death, unfortunately. And in our young people, there is uh, a preponderance still of chronic diseases that cause death, so uh, anything from birth defects to cancer to leukemia. But there's also three in particular trends that are on the rise, the ones that we've failed to really get a grip on. Uh, one of them is allergies. So we're seeing a greater rise in allergies and things like uh, breathing difficulties, hay fever and other complications, respiratory complications. But we're also seeing a rise in things like mental health issues in younger people. There's something about the modern world that is proving quite challenging for younger people as they enter a more complex, stressful, faster social media world. Uh, so mental health is a particular problem, but also there's an, a huge increase in childhood obesity. And this is something that really represents a, a, a tragedy in, in some ways. Uh, children up to 10 years old, uh, up to 40% of all children are overweight or obese. Uh, and this is, means that things like diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which is usually something you would get in middle age, is now starting to appear in greater numbers in children. So we've got a real challenge uh, uh, to try and address some of these really fundamental uh, new health challenges in, in our children today. So a little bit of the health problems, but what about the general health world itself? How's, it, how's the world changing around the healthcare system? So as well as the disease we've talked about, what we're seeing is uh, a change in, the, in demand, what people want from healthcare systems. So there are new needs, there are new behaviours, people are becoming a lot more aware of their health, they want help in areas where they may have been a little bit stoical and got on with it now. People seek support and help uh, much more often, so there's more contact, more demand. And societal expectations about health are changing as well, so the nature of demand is also changing as well as the nature of disease, so that's uh, 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 an interesting challenge. And we're seeing new tech, new treatments, new business models, new forms of delivery and new skills required, new resources and new organisational models as new actors try and find a way to build a, a next generation sustainable healthcare system. So there are a lot of forces at play on healthcare which are traumatic. In fact, the world is changing faster around healthcare systems than healthcare systems can change themselves. And this is a, an underlying problem which is played out in, in the way that a lot of healthcare systems now are finding that the inflation of cost just from older people with more diseases and more treatments being invented that they need to, to prescribe is that costs are going up about 5% a year. And we're now in a world where 10 years of austerity and probably more to come, there's an economic tension there that just means that that old model of doing healthcare can't be uh, sustained in the longer term. Uh, and at risk is, the, is the, the idea that public health will be delivered in the way that it's always been. It, it's getting difficult to reconcile the growing cost, the lack of investment and, and money available to support that. So there is a big tension and a big need now to rethink how do we do healthcare, especially in a world where the tech, there's much more technology. So talking of technology, we are now standing at the dawn of the biggest transformation in health and technology that there's ever been in the history of humanity. We've come a long way in the last 10, 15, 20 years, but the next 10 to 20 years is going to see an acceleration of change of a scale we've never encountered before. And it's going to be a, a, a mixture of robotics, AI and technology, massive breakthroughs in gene sequencing and understanding the genetic codes of how we operate and how we work, and also an understanding of how humanity and technology and biology come together in new forms to produce new opportunities for changing health. This is the most exciting time to ever be in healthcare. We're standing at the dawn of a really radical new age. So I've done some work recently with um, putting forward a report, which all of you are welcome to download, uh, which was really inspired by the Royal Free uh, Trust, who uh, are one of the biggest trusts in North London. 
and the Royal Free Charity that sits alongside that, the CEO wanted to do a, a piece of work to investigate all that I'm, I've just been talking about. He essentially recognised that uh, the healthcare system that he was part of is entering a world where they've got to start to work together with other actors. How do hospitals and primary care, public health, social care that have historically all worked in separate silos, they're all serving the same population. So how does a local healthcare system start to work together to improve the healthcare of the system? What does that look like? Lots of questions. Um, how do we start thinking about people as whole people rather than an organ? So uh, one of the challenges is the siloed nature of healthcare. So if you go into a, a hospital, your cardiologist will talk to you about your heart. But if you've got a problem self somewhere else, you've got to go see another specialist and he'll look at that. So we've got a healthcare system that largely looks at your organ. And the fact there's a person attached to it is kind of an administrative function, not the core of understanding there's a human being here that has a variety of different conditions that ideally needs to be supported and helped and managed as a person, not as a series of organs or managed completely separately, leaving the individual to kind of join all the dots. And as we've talked about, there's massive new medical breakthroughs and lots of new technology. So if you're sat in the healthcare system at the moment trying to think, where do I place my bets? What do I invest in? How do I build into this technology future? It's very confusing, it's very difficult, it's very uh, difficult to know what to do. So the ask was, could you do a piece of work that looks 10 to 15 years into the future and look at the long-term trends that are starting to show and imagine a world where they've all landed at scale? What does healthcare look like when all this capability is there? What does healthcare look like for the individual? And what will it mean for the healthcare system? And where will innovation sit in that? So essentially what the ask was, can you look beyond the fog, which is what the report is called, to some future where a lot of these trends have landed? And then we can use that as a kind of light that shines from the future back to now so we can start to make our decisions in a way that takes us towards where the vision seems to be going, rather than we're all completely confused and grasping at innovations without really understanding how it all fits together. So the report that we did looked at six different trends, key megatrends. What is the world likely to look like in 10 to 15 years? So the role of technology, how society is changing, the burden of disease, all that kind of thing. What's the future understanding of how our body works that will change the nature of what medicine is, what health is? And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Personalised medicine, instead of one-size-fits-all treatments and one-size-fits-all medication, how do we in the future world start to design and personalise treatment and support specifically for you? That's going to be a really interesting thing. Medtech innovation, what's coming through in terms of new technologies that allows us to measure things that currently may have to happen in, in hospitals. You have blood tests or scans. But there's a whole interesting set of technology that is miniaturizing point of care diagnostics and creating sensors that can do things at a nano scale. So we're entering a world where sensors will start to appear in the body, on the body, around the body to measure things uh, and detect things in greater levels of uh, granularity than we've ever thought possible, which obviously gives us an insight to the details of what health and well-being is, is made up of. It gives us information to about, about how we might respond to that. And of course, linked to that is if we've got a world where we've got 10, 100, 1,000, million times more data, how do we make sense of all that? the future of artificial intelligence is going to be really important in trying to make sense of all this exploding data. And then finally, the psychology of health. We've got all this capability. How do we ensure that we engage people in a conversation? That we can take this new capability and bring it into their lives in ways that are meaningful, that's able to be understood, and a world where people will probably take more responsibility for their own health. But we need to give them this capability in a way that makes sense to them, that they want to grasp and take on and make a bigger part of their everyday life. So there's a great bit of psychology here as well, which often uh, the technology people forget about. So 
as I mentioned, uh, we've got a report that's out, which you're more than welcome to, to, to give, which sets really this bigger landscape of where the future is going. And it's really looking at the transformational improvements of health and well-being, thinking about a pathway to sustaining a sustainable healthcare system. So it's interesting to politicians and healthcare leaders as well as practitioners. And really thinking about the role health plays, not just in keeping people well, but as an engine for social renewal as well. So, all great stuff, but what is health? What do we mean by health? Talk about it, health, 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 health. What is health? Well, it's a big topic, but I'm gonna take you very quickly through four areas that comprise the world that we're going to be dealing with, with sensors and technology and AI. One is the body, just because it's interesting, how the body works. Uh, the biome, so we'll go into the uh, guts and have a look at what's being revealed about what goes on in there. We'll have a little look at the brain. And then finally, our interactions with the world, as we saw earlier from different socioeconomic classes, that are obviously the way we live our lives has a profound impact on our health as well as what our genes give us by, by way of uh, destiny. So, human genome. I'm going to test you now. How many people know how many genes there are in the whole human genome? Any ideas? Any guesses? <laughs> no idea. Many. Three billion pairs. <laughs> Three billion pairs. And there's, there's four uh, chemicals that form uh, the genetic co. And it's huge, right? We don't realise how complicated uh, the, the, each of those genes are. If you were to take the letters and of the, our three billion code and write them out, just in normal size, as one long stream, when you finished writing the three billionth, you'd have a piece of paper that would stretch from London to Brazil. That's how long the genome is. So it's amazingly <laughs> complex, three billion uh, base pairs. Um, and do you know what the number of cells are in your body? Of which the genes exist inside each one. 30 trillion cells that on average renew themselves every one to two years. So the chemistry that's going on inside you to rebuild your cells with 30 trillion cells, each with this three billion code in it, you get a sense of the sheer complexity and amazing design of the human body. Your bodies are amazing. And I'm not doing that as saying that as a pickup line. I'm just, <laughs> they are amazing. So uh, our ge genetic code is amazing. Um, but the way that genes speak, because they hold the code, they hold the instruction set, is that they speak through the language of proteins. So the DNA here, in this double helix, uh, gives instructions that generate the production of proteins. And these proteins go off into the body and they encode a lot of the instructions that uh, deliver the function of the internal workings of the cell and of the, the cells themselves. So that cells start to grow and have different functions and perform in different ways. And there are well over 60,000 different proteins being used as a communications language. So genes speak through proteins. And what's being understood at the moment is not only how the genetic sequencing, but also what some of these genes do and what some of the proteins that they create, what function they have. And mostly, they work fine. Occasionally, they go wrong, or you might have a mutation that causes something to go wrong. So analyzing the proteins is starting to provide a new language about how the body is speaking and creating itself. And through that, there's a growing awareness of what constitutes wellness and what constitutes the early precursors to disease. What are the proteins that start to appear that signify something is starting to go wrong way before you even notice it? So this is giving a whole new language to understand how our bodies work and the areas that we might be looking at in the future to understand what keeps us well and what might cause us to be sick 
and what might we be able to do about treating it? Because one of the things that's really interesting is that new, uh, new forms of uh, antibodies, new forms of uh, immunology are being created where we can even take our own antibodies, take them out of the body, program them and change them to recognize some of these proteins, to go back in and zap things that otherwise would have caused us to be sick. So there's a whole new era of innovative medicines coming along, which is fantastic. So that's the body. Let's get into the guts of the, of the healthcare. Um, the, the biome, a very sort of ignored part, it's now sort of coming to the fore as being a really important part of our, healthcare, uh, our health. Now the biome, the gut, of course, is the intestines. And it's full of bacteria. Uh, most of you will be familiar with probiotics and prebiotics. They're there to kind of keep our bacteria healthy. But there are probably around 60,000 types of bacteria. And anyone want to have a guess how many of these bacteria there are there? Anyone want to guess? We said there's 30 trillion cells in the human body. How many gut bacteria? Now, estimates are suggesting there's at least 40 trillion, possibly even more. So there are more cells in your gut, more bacteria cells, than there are entire cells of your body. And these 60,000 cells are taking what comes in, metabolizing it, uh, and which we then absorb into our, our body. So this is the world's biggest chemistry experiment going on inside our guts. And what's being revealed is that the, 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 the connection between the guts, our functioning, our mental health, is largely mediated by this highly complex uh, environment here, which we're just starting to learn. So we're starting to see, and we will see, major breakthroughs in understanding the gut biome. And already there are some innovations around poo transplants, which is essentially taking bacteria from one person and putting it into another to see if we can change the, uh, the bacterial mix. And you can actually go and get poo tablets, because some people don't well, like the idea of this sort of uh, poo transplants, where you actually get poo in a little capsule, and you can swallow it, you won't taste anything, and then you, you get it through that way. So we're already at the interesting cutting edge of some interesting uh, developments there. So we've done the body, we've done the guts, let's go to the brain. Brain. How many neurons do you think are in the brain? I'm hitting you with some big numbers. The answer is about 100 billion neurons in the brain. And neurons are connected to other neurons. And the more that we do things, the more they connect. So the average neuron is connected to about 14,000 other neurons. So we've got this huge mesh of neurons talking to other neurons. And there are more pathways through the brain than there are known atoms in the entire universe. That's how complicated our brain is. It is by far and away the most complex structure in the entire universe. Again, our bodies are amazing, right? So um, what we've, in, in, our, in our mental health, if you like, uh, these more anterior parts of the brain are ones that control systems like our breathing, like our blood pressure, these things we, we're not aware of, they're sort of self-auto-control systems. Our limbic systems are much more involved in emotions that sort of guide our thinking and decisions without having to think about it. But the prefrontal cortex, this bit is unique, uniquely developed in humans and it's in there that we understand or think that many of our cognitive thinking occurs. Um, so there's huge uh, developments being made in understanding the nature and function of these different parts of the brain, but there's still a long way to go. Scientists have no idea what consciousness is. No idea. Still can't answer it. So lots of work to be done. So bringing that all together, what do we mean by health? Well, this is the World Health Organization's definition of health. A state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being 
and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. That's really interesting because that's extending the definition of health beyond the clinical to healthy living in a wider sense. And as we'll see in a minute, that's really, really important for getting on top of healthcare in the 21st century. Why is that important? Well, there's lots of research being done. This is just one that shows that our genes account for pretty much only 15% of the reasons why we might die early from disease. Our environment, pollution, etc., 10%. Are the quality of healthcare, if we do get sick, how good is that? 25%. But up to 50% is the way we're living our lives. Up to 50% of our likelihood to get sick and die has nothing to do with the genes, it's the way we live. So if we're going to get on top of healthcare in the 21st century, we've got to move out of just the clinical side and look at this more holistically. And this is what we've essentially done in our report. So I'll just give you a couple of slides there to show you that picture. So, uh, cells to cities, that's what we called it, the holistic determinants of health. So if you take a person, here we got, they're, they're physical. What we see is right down from the genes through to these molecular networks with proteins we've been talking about that then inform cellular networks that then build organ networks that build you, the complex adaptive system. What we're seeing and will do in the next 10, 15 years is a movement away from just purely treating organ-based diseases like heart disease, dementia, and diabetes as being something to prop up and, and support the symptoms of that organ to getting right back to understanding what are the precursors to disease and can we spot those and can we treat them before people get sick. So there's going to be masses of really exciting innovation around prevention uh, in a clinical sense. But as we've seen, it's also about our awareness and our ability to look after ourselves if we do get sick. Our be health behaviours, the life choices that we make are part and parcel because these create stresses back into the body. But these life choices are in themselves uh, dependent on a lot of our social determinants. If we're poor, we've got poor relationships, our kids are out of control, we've, we're, our lives are out of control, then or, or with left with very little resources to, from which to, to make healthy choices, then of course we will make unhealthier choices and we will get sicker. And those social determinants are also then linked to environment. If you're living in a place that's dangerous, you're unlikely to go out and do as much exercise. If you're living in a place that doesn't have healthy food choices around you and just has uh, fast food outlets, then of course, the environment then sets the, the, the stage, if you like, for all of this to happen. So cells to cities is really an invitation to say that the 21st century, if we're going to get on top of healthcare, we need to look at that entire landscape because all of that generates health outcomes. We need to move away from just clinical, look at behavioral and social and, and, and environmental. And why this is so exciting in the next 10 to 15 years is, as I mentioned, we're going to start seeing sensors in the body, sensors on the body and around the body, sensors capturing information about our lifestyle, our homes, our relationships, and information about the environments that we move in. Like, to what degree are pe people exercising? Where do they go? Where do they? What, what good food and healthy resources are available? So we're entering a world where data is going to pour out of that environment in a, w in a way that we've never seen before, that for the first time will give us the opportunity to see what's going on at an individual level so we can support people to live healthier as well as take medication, look after themselves better. And as we step back and look at whole communities, what's going on with younger people? What's going on with people in these areas? Why is there greater levels of sickness here? Why do some people thrive and others don't? We'll start to pull data out from that that will able us to identify some of these causal links that we know are there, but we've never been able to measure them and understand them. And this is going to be really important for, under, for helping government, local government, and other actors in the healthcare system to understand where their piece of this puzzle can fit together into a, a greater public health whole. So, that's great. But one of the challenges this is, as we get, be able to measure more and more things, more and more bits of people, as we unpack our body, our mind, 
our world and measure different bits of it, uh, we're, we're essentially fragmenting ourselves and fragmenting our understanding. There's specialists for this, there's specialists for that, specialists for every single piece of this giant jigsaw. But how do we make sure that we don't lose sight of the person? Because behind all of that fragmenting data is a human being. And life and health is lived by us as human beings. And especially as we're here today to talk about children, we, need, we owe it <laughs> to ourselves to be able to bring this expanding knowledge together to, to answer the question, what do we do? How should we take this knowledge? How do we turn it into action that can give ourselves and our children better health care? That's going to be a challenge. We've suddenly got all this knowledge, but how do we bring it together and make it usable and actionable? And this is where artificial intelligence is going to be so important because there's going to be too much data coming out for any human to process and it'll be coming out real time. We have at this point to look at how we can use our tools of the future, machine learning and artificial intelligence, to bring some of that together. So we've been doing some thinking about what that might look like. So today, if you've got a doctor's record, you'll have, a, if you're lucky, an electronic health record. Some of it may still be on paper. And it will have a record of who you are, where you live, what did you come in with, what symptoms did you present, what tests did we do, what diagnostics did we make, what, what medicines did we give you, what happened when you came three months later, and it's like a bum, 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 bum. In this world, we're saying, actually, data's pouring in from all these environments. It needs to be brought together. And what we've seen from looking at other industries, which have loads and loads of real-time data, how do they make sense of it? Take uh, weather, for example. What they do is take all these data and they build a simulated model of the healthcare environment. So through that model, through that simulation, they can start to predict what's the weather like D to B in six hours or next week, the forces that are at play. So this becomes really important in interpreting lots of data and making it valuable and useful. Why can't we do that for human beings? Why can't we start thinking about creating a digital double, a, a data simulation of ourselves that looks at our history, where we are now, and allows predictive models to be looked at in terms of if we were to do that, what might happen? Can we start to predict what might be the best course of action and inform with all this data what we might do next to create better healthcare for individuals and societies? So what it yields is essentially a digital health coach, if you like, which is bringing all that data together to play it back to us in, su in a usable, uh, understandable way so that we can take action upon that data. It's almost like a simulation that understands us and can give us advice. And this could be, uh, and is likely to be uh, done in forms which will speak to us through all forms of new media. So it may be an avatar, or maybe on the phone, or it may be wherever it may be. But it's likely also to take the form of robots, which is what we're here today to talk about, especially for, for young children, giving that information a form and a presence that, that can be identifiable, something they can play with, something that can add, uh, a, a, can build a conversation in a way that's understandable and fun to, to, to deal with. So taking all that information, using artificial intelligence and playing it back to us in something holistic is, think, is going to be really, really important. As well as, of course, making it important for healthcare professionals so they can see that data and know exactly your history, where you are now, what your goals and aspirations are, and have a much more informed conversation with you about how they can help you or pick up where the last person left off rather than having to start all over from again. So pulling all that together and saying, what would a healthcare system of the future look like? Sensors pouring data out from us process through with a, a, a digital health coach playing back to us to support us in wellness, emotional, we want some help, spotting the early signs of disease so we can get you in and treated before you become symptomatic. If you've got long-term conditions, being able to support more holistically and helping people live uh, independent for longer. And all of this data then are now allowing the healthcare system to stop operating in lots of little silos because every part of the healthcare system could see the whole picture. So it starts to bring together the ability to do holistic support of people, either in the community, helping people to live well and look after themselves, or if they get really sick, then the specialists have a holistic model they can also look like. 
look at. And with this health data showing where all the problems are, uh, which may extend into food, into exercise, into the way people are emotionally, enables us to think about how might you bring other industries in to share this challenge of improving the public's health. Because essentially it will be like a, a heat map of where the problems are. Where are people not eating well or where are problems with, with emotional or, or loneliness and how might we use the resources we've got with this knowledge to point individuals and people to the resources that can best help them. So we really see a, a, a completely different learning uh, system of the future. Why is this a good idea? As we said earlier, healthcare systems are running out of control on the old model. They're getting more and more expensive. There's not enough money to fund them. So if we can help people stay well. We can spot the earliest risks and get in there quick. We can lower the cost of healthcare because people are going to stay better, uh, well better. If they've got long-term conditions, we can look after them better. And if we've got uh, the ability to support people as they get older to live independently for as long as possible because technology is helping them, that's going to be great. So we see this real, this, the, the opportunity of technology to reduce the amount of time that you live sick. In it, uh, and as a result, the entire healthcare system is going to find that its cost base lowered. And we have over the, open the opportunity, healthier society, more sustainable healthcare system and a more productive society because people who are sick and not well are unable to be as, as active in, in the economy as, as such. So, given all that, how do we think about n where we are now and starting on this journey, the journey of digital innovation? Um, so when we think about how do we do digital innovation, is it about taking an existing care model now and digitizing it? Now, most people would say, you know, we've got this thing that we do and the doctor does this and then, and then. how about we make that digital? It will save money, probably, make it easier to use, use it 24 seven. Yeah, that's good. But I would argue that that is not the most complete way of thinking about it. How can we rethink what we're doing to support people in healthcare in a digital world? How can we rethink how to support people in the digital world. That opens up the landscape for not just digitizing our current forms and processes, but rethinking completely how we can support and help people stay well and look after them when they're sick. And digital really opens up uh, an amazing opportunity. So we, instead of people coming to a healthcare professional once a week, once a month, healthcare can come to you into your life. And when you look at the average life, what we find is that most people's lives are part of routines. They sleep at night, they get up in the morning, they have some breakfast, they travel to work or school, they do their stuff, have a snack, have a lunch, come home, do stuff, relax. A lot of life fits a pattern, and you may have a weekday pattern and a weekend pattern and occasionally go on holiday, but there is very deep patterns of behaviors ingrained in people's lives. And one of the interesting things about uh, smartphones and wearables and sensors is that they're going to become present in that environment. So what's happening in the moments of our life? The ability to collect data and understand a model and model that is going to help us to understand how are people coping? Why do they eat the certain things? What are the triggers that cause them to do certain things? This rich data is going to enable us to support and help people to nudge their behaviors, or in the case of medication, understand when they should be taking their medication, what happens around that, and how can we construct experiences that fit into the lives of our patients, rather than just giving them some medication and telling them to take it and then wonder why 40% of people don't take their medication. So this requires a new way of thinking about digital. Health brings new challenges. And what are really five buckets of expertise are required. Sort of health expertise, you need to understand the context. Behaviour change. Just because you tell someone to do it doesn't mean they're going to do it. So how do you tap into the psychology, motivate people, set them goals, and all the other behaviour change techniques, which uh, I'm sure Bruno will, will talk about. How do you make it engaging? Because it's got to be fun. 
Uh, how do you design the user interface and interactions to make it compelling and useful in the moments that you, you want to use it in the ways that people want to use it? And how do you use data to create solutions that are not fixed, but learn and adapt over time to learn you and learn what you, the journey that you're on? This is a different type of skill. And if we're to care for our children in particular, getting this right is absolutely key to the design process, to tap in to the fact we have children who think and feel and play and see the world in a certain way. We need to design solutions that tap into them and, and be able to pull out from them and engage them in really interesting ways.